Welcome to, to this lesson on Mechanics 1. The unit code is BPY1101, and I'm going to take you through the first lesson. It is going to include uh, the unit of measurements and the uh, error analysis. Physics is a quantitative science based on measurements of physical quantities. Certain physical quantities have been chosen as fundamental or base quantities. The fundamental quantities that are chosen are uh, we have the length, we have the mass, we have uh, the time, and we have the electric, we have the electric current, we have the dynamic uh, temperature, amount of substance, and the luminance intensity. Each base quantity is defined in terms of certain, of certain basic arbitrary chosen but properly standardized reference uh, uh, units which include uh, the meter, uh, kilogram, uh, second, ampere, kelvin, mole, and cadera. The units for the fundamental base quantities are called fundamental or base units and two supplementary units in relation to quantities, uh, plane angles, solid angles, radians, and steel radians. We have an example of the fundamental quantities in the table. We have fundamental quantities, uh, we have the fundamental units, and the assembles. So length, as one of the fundamental quantities, the fundamental unit of length is meter, and the symbol is m. Mass, as a fundamental quantity of measurement, the, its unit is in kilogram, and the symbol is kg. We have the electric current, the fundamental unit is ampere, and the symbol is A. We have the luminous intensity, and this one is measured uh, in cadera, and the symbol of it is CD. We have the amount of substance. The amount of substance, the, the fundamental unit of amount of substance is mole, and the symbol is MOL. Then, uh, from the fundamental quantities, we go to the derived quantities. And other physical quantities divided from the base quantities can be expressed as a combination of the base units and are called the derived units. A complete set of units, both fundamental and derived units, are called a system of units. An example of derived units include we have volume, uh, density, the force, and there are many. From, th from there we move on to the international systems of units. The international systems of units are based on seven base units that we have already seen. And in computing any physical quantity, the unit for derived quantities involved in relations are treated as though they were algebraic quantities till the desired unit are obtained. So we have three systems, and the first one is CGS system. And in CGS system, the unit of length is in centimeters, and the unit of mass is in grams, and the unit of time is given in seconds. Then the sec system number two is FPS system. And in this system, the unit of length is given in foot, and the unit of mass is given in pound, and the unit of time is given in second. Then the MKS system, in this system, 
the unit of length is given in terms of meters, the unit of mass is given in kilograms, and the unit of time is given in second. Then we have the SI unit, I mean the SI uh, system, and this system contained the seven fundamental units and two supplementary fundamental units. The SI units are used in all physical measurements for both the base quantities and the derived quantities. Certain derived units are expressed by means of SI units of special names such as the Joule, we have the Newton, and we have the Watt that defines the power. So we will go through uh, just two fundamental units of measurement and the first one I'm going to tackle is the measurement of length. So we define length as the measurement or the extent of something from one end to the, to the other end. And the length is a scalar quantity and a square, scalar quantity means it, it only has the magnitude and it does not have a definite direction. And every experiment in physics requires the use of length to get the desired result. All the external physical measurements rely on length. As an example, take your height. How, you will measure your, how do you measure your height? And if you are asked, what is your height? Height is simply, height is simply the distance between the feet and your leg. And to measure the height, you can use either a scale or a measure stick. We need a unit to define the length of some, something, as without unit, we won't be able to compare measure or correlate two objects on the terms of their length. The standard unit, the standard unit of length is meter, but being a small unit, we refer to the big unit to make the measurement simple. There are several kinds of instruments we use to measure the length of an object. And this includes, we use a vernier caliper to measure the length. We can use micrometer screw gauge to measure the diameters of very small wires. We use meter scale to measure length. We can use we can still use the tape measures to measure the length. There are some objects which, can, which cannot be measured with the help of scales and instruments, like the height of a mountain, like the radius of the earth, or other large bodies. And to measure, to measure, to measure them, we use some special methods. And these special methods, huh? we have uh, two special methods that we can use to measure them. Uh, these include the parallax method, and we have the echo method. We start with the parallax method. A parallax method is used to measure large distances and work on the principles of the parallax, parallax basis. A parallax is defined as the apparent displacement, I mean, so as apparent displacement of an object when a, an observer point of view changes. An example, hold a pencil in your hand. You hold a pencil in your hand and you close your left eye and you'll see the pencil now will, will have shifted. You close the, the right hand eye again you see the pencil. You will find that the position of the image of the pencil is different in each case. 
This is what is referred to as a parallax, and your eye are used as a basis. Now, to measure a distance d on a point A from a planet S by the parallax method, we will observe it from two different views, A and B. The distance between A and B, we ascribe it as small letter B. The angle that is going to be formed between the two points and the object, we assume it to be angle ASB, or angle theta. And this one, this angle which is formed, is called the parallax angle, or paralactic angle. As the distance between the planet and observation point is very, is very large, we can assume that B that we had assigned to be the distance, and then D, the capital B, the, the, the measure, the, the, the capital B is the measure of the point from A to the planet S, we can assume that that one is going to be very, very small or less than one, which means that the angle theta will be very, very small. We proceed further by taking the triangle, the triangle that we had, assi uh, that we had assigned ASB in a form of arc, where the length of the arc is B, and the radius of the arc is given as capital D. Then the arc length will be given, or it is equals to the radius, you multiply by the angle theta. And remember, this angle theta is an angle that we had defined it as the parallax angle. Then you will find the distance is going to be given by D, which is, which is the distance of the point A from, from a planet S, and then theta, which is the parallax angle. So it is going to be given by d, you multiply by theta. An example, we have an example, a worked example. A planet is observed from two points, A and B on Earth. The angle theta, that is a parallax angle, is the, uh, the, the angle theta is 3.32 times 10 to the power negative 2 in radians. The diameter of the earth is about 1.276 times 10 to the power 7 meters. The question is, find out the distance between the earth and the moon. So based on what we have seen, we will have our theta as 3.32 times 10 to the power negative 2 in radians. Taking two points on the diameter of the earth, we will have the diameter of the earth as 1.27 times, uh, times 10 to the power 7. So the unknown quantity D, we see it, it is going to be given by B, you divide by theta, where B now is 1.27 times 10 to power, neg uh, to power 7. So D is going to be given by 1.276 times 10 to the power 7, you divide by 3.32 times 10 to the power negative 2, and therefore you are D. That is, the, the, the distance between the earth and the moon is going to be given by 3.84 times 10 to the power, to power 8 meters. So we move on to the second method, the echo method. The echo method is used to find the distance of a hill or a building from a certain point on the surface of the earth. In this method, in this method, we can we shoot a gun or a radio wave and we'll and we measure the time interval in which the gun or the radio wave is fired and the instant the echo is heard. If T is the time taken by the sound to travel from the observer to the hill and back to the hill, 
and s is the distance between the observer and the hill, then we know from the ordinary mechanics that speed is equals to distance you divide by time. And therefore, the distance in this case will be 2 and flow, and therefore we multiply s with 2, and then you divide by the time. And since the total distance covered by the hill, uh, the reason why we have multiplied by 2 is that the distance or the total distance covered by the sound will be double because it is to and fro. If we know the speed of the sound, which ordinarily is given, we can easily find the distance between the observation point and the hill. And whatever we are going to get, or the, 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 this method is the one that is referred to as the echo method. The range of objects and heavenly bodies varies over a wide range. For an example, the size of the universe is in the order of 10 raised to power 26 meters, whereas the size of a tiny nucleus of an atom is just in the tune of 10 raised to power negative 14 meters. We can use certain units to define length at both, the, at, at both levels. The R, we can use one Fermi, that is one F, it is equals to 10 raised to power negative 15 meters. We, and we can also use angstrom, and one angstrom is equals to 10 raised to power negative 10 meters, or, or we can use astronomical unit, or AU. And this one is given as 1.496 times 10 to power 11 meters. And into bracket, it is also the average distance between the sun and the earth. Or, lastly, we can use one or a right year, units in light years. And the definition of a right year is, it is a distance which the right will travel with the velocity of 3 times 10 to power 8 meters per second in one, in one year. The table below depicts the range and the order of different lengths. So we have, we move on from length, we, we move, move on to the mass as a fundamental unit. Mass is defined as a physical property of a body. Mass is a measure which helps us in analyzing how strong is a mutual attraction between two bodies. It is generally wrong to believe that mass is the same as weight, because most of the, most of, in most instances, the, the term weight is used interchangeably with mass. So, but we know that mass is always constant everywhere, where else weight is a variable quantity. That is, it depends on, on its uh, platform, where it is placed. An example, if you go to the moon, the planet moon, the weight, the weight of the object varies. It is going to reduce because the gravitational acceleration of the moon is different from the gravitational acceleration of the earth. Mass is also independent of uh, temperature. It is also independent of the pressure or the position of an object in space. Mass is expressed in different measures, but its standard unit is a kilogram and the stable of kilogram is kg. The unit of measuring mass is always chosen convenience-wise. Uh, convenience it means if we want to weigh a large animal, we will prefer to use kilogram as a unit of measurement. And if we have very small animal, then we, sweep, we switch to another convenient unit. When it comes to the measurement, uh, measuring uh, mass at the mic mi uh, microscopic level, 
the standard unit of mass is called uniform atomic mass. What is uniform, uh, uni uh, unified atomic mass? The uniform, unified atomic mass is a standard unit of measuring mass on atomic and subatomic level. It is denoted by the symbol U, and it is also known as atomic mass unit, into bracket AMU. Atomic mass is defined as 1 over 12 mass of carbon, 12 isotope. In mathematically, one unified atomic mass unit is equals to 1 over 12 times mass of carbon 12 isotope. And therefore, when you do that calculation, you'll find that 1 AMU, that is 1 atomic mass unit, is equals to 1.66 times 10 to the power negative 27 uh, kilogram. How do, we, uh, how do you measure uh, mass? We measure mass in different forms and we do with different uh, methods. Consider the following examples. A common object, human or other product, can be weighed using weighing machine and a common balance. In most cases, this is what is used in the grocery shops and etc. We, we use a gravitational formula to determine the masses of large celestial bodies like the earth, the stars, the sun, and the moon. For measuring subatomic and atomic elements, we use mass spectrograph in which the radius of the path of the atom of the atomic particle is directly proportional to the mass of the charged particle moving under the influence of strong electric and magnetic field. Now, we, will, we, we have various methods or the instruments that are used to measure the mass. We have the spring balance. You have the spring balance. And we have others that I will not be able to, uh, to name at this point. So from the, 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 the fundamental units, eh, we move on to the dimension analysis. Now, we will start by defining or looking at what is dimension analysis in physics. Dimension analysis involves the study of relationship between physical quantities with the help of their dimensions and units of measurement. We use dimension analysis in order to convert a unit from one form to another. In science, or in general in mathematics problems, we have to keep the unit same so that we can perform the mathematical operations easily. That is, the equation must have sense. Whatever is on your left-hand side of the equation must be the same in terms of the units on the right-hand side of the equation. So dimension analysis is also called factor rebel method or unit factor method as we use conversion factor in order to get the same units. As an example, if we want to know how many minutes are there in three hours, what are we going to do? We generally think as follows. We start from what is one hour in terms of minutes. One hour is equal to 60 minutes. Now, if one hour is equal to six minutes, then three hours, it will mean that it is three, you multiply by 60 minutes, which is equal to one eight minutes. So you can see here we have a conversion factor. And the conversion factor here is 60 minutes. So we use con conversion factors accordingly so that the answer comes in the desired unit and biased results are, un are unavoided. Example number two. 
to find out how many kilograms are there in 52 pounds, in this case, we have to convert pounds into kilogram. And generally, we have a conversion factor that 1 kg is equal to 2.2 pounds. So we can use this figure as our conversion factor. Now we have 2.2046 pounds is equal to 1 kg, and therefore 52 pounds will be equal to 52. You multiply by 1 over 2.2046 kg, which is going to give us 23.58 kg. So therefore you can see our conversion factor in that case it is 2.2046. Example number three, we, to find out how many feet are in 140 centimeters, in this case we have to convert centimeters into feet. Since we cannot convert centimeters directly into feet, we will convert it into inches, and then after converting it into inches, inches sorry, we convert it to feet. This involves the calculation of two conversion factors. And the first conversion factor is the inches into centimeters. Well, we know that one inch is equals to 2.54 centimeters. So one centimeter in terms of the inches will be given by one over the conversion factor, which is 2.54 inches. Therefore, uh, 12 inches, we again know that a feet consists of 12 feet, I mean, a, a feet consists of 12 inches. And therefore, in terms of the centimeters, one feet will be equals to 12, you multiply by 2.54. And this gives us 30.48 centimeters. So we can confidently say that one feet is equals to 30.48 centimeters. So if one feet is equals to 30.48 centimeters, then one centimeter is equals to one you divide by 30.48, and therefore, the 140 that we are supposed to, uh, to find the amount of feet in it is going to be given by 140. You multiply by the conversion factor, which, uh, and you get 4.59 feet. It means that 140 centimeters is equal to 4.59 feet. Now, as we have seen, there is a lot of application of the dimension analysis in science or in the engineering. So the application, let's look at the application of the dimension analysis. Dimension analysis is a very basic aspect of measurement and has many applications in real life physics. We use dimension analysis for three prominent reasons. And the first one is we use dimension analysis to look at the consistency of the dimensional equation. Number two, we use dimension analysis to derive a relationship between physical quantities in physical phenomena. And three, we use dimension analysis to change units from one system to another. Let's start with the first usage to check the consistency of a dimensional equation. We all know that we can add or subtract physical quantities only if they have the same dimension. So we, in essence, we do not have a way where we can have an equation, maybe on one side it is in centimeters, and on the other side of the equation, the unit is in meters. 
So the similarity, the similarity of dimension of a physical quantity is called the consistency of a dimensional equation. As an example, take mass and the velocity. We, can, we can't add or subtract these two physical quantities as they are of different dimensions. In essence, that is what I had explained, that you cannot add or subtract two, physical, two, two different physical quantities. We know the dimension of mass is m, and the dimension of velocity is length you divide by time, that is L, L t raised to power negative 1. So if you look at the equation, the, fo the formed equation, it has two different units. A dimension equation is said to be consistent only and only if dimensions of equations are same on both sides. If dimensions of the equations are not same on both sides, then the equation is said to be dimensionally incorrect. Also, rem also remember that if an equation is dimensionally correct, it does not mean it is completely correct equation. Let's look at methods, how to check, how you can check consistency of a dimension equation. Let's, let's define the speed. Speed, we know that uh, from mechanics, speed is given as distance over time. The dimension of speed is length, because distance, the dimension of distance is length, and the dimension of time is, uh, uh, the time is second. So we have length, you divide by time, and therefore we will have LT. L over T, sorry. So if we are checking the dimension on the left-hand side, eh? the dimension of the speed, we know that it is L, T raised to power negative 1, and the dimension of distance over time is L, you divide by T. So solving that equation, you will find that the unit on the left-hand side is the same as the unit on the right-hand side. And it means that the equation is consist is consist <coughs> it is consistent. It has consistency in terms of the direction. And therefore, we can equally say that the equation is dimensionally correct, as the dimension of speed is same on both sides. Dimension analysis is a basic test to find out the consistency of the equation and does not guarantee the correctness of the equation. One drawback of this method is that we can't predict constant of many physical quantities. Also, the logarithmic, trigonometric, and expon exponential functions are all dimensionless. And therefore, you cannot say that whatever you're going to get when you have done the dimension in an equation, that the formula that is going to be generated is, is guaranteed to be correct. Number two, as an example, another, another example of how we can check consistency using the dimension we know <coughs> that from the equations of the linear motion, the distance S is given by the original distance, you multiply by velocity, you multiply by time, plus a half AT squared, where X and X naught are distances, T is a time, and V is a velocity and A is the acceleration of the body. Now, to check if the above equation is dimensionally correct, 
we have to prove that dimensions of physical quantities are same on both sides. Also, we have to keep in mind that quantities can only be added or subtracted if their dimensions are the same. So let's look at the individual dimensions of the variables in our equation. X, this one signifies X is a distance and the dimension of distance is L. X naught is also, its dimension is distance and therefore the dimension of distance is L. Vt, that is velocity multiplied by time, we know the dimension of velocity is L t raised to the power negative 1 and the dimension of time as t. Solving the powers, you can see that t and t will cancel one another and therefore Vt, the dimension of Vt is again L. Now look, let's look at the third dimension, uh, the, the, the third variable in the equation, which is a t squared. A, we said it is the acceleration, and t is the time. So a t squared is acceleration you multiply by time squared. So if you look at their dimensions, the acceleration is the dimension the dimension of the acceleration is L T raised to the power negative two. The dimension of time is T, and in this case, T is uh, squared, and therefore, when we solve, when we solve the powers, we will get that the dimension of A T squared is equals to L. Then, as we had said, we do uh, the, the, the units, that is numbers, they are, they are dimensionless. So we cannot be able to dimension the factor one a half. And therefore, when we look at what is on the left hand side and what is on the right hand side, then it is giving us the same dimension. And we can make the conclusion that the equation is said to be consistent and it is dimensionally correct. Another example. Let's check whether the given equation is dimensionally correct. That is, work, work done is equals to a half mv squared u minus mgh. So w is the work done. M is the mass and g is the gravity and v is the velocity and h it equals to the height to check the above equation whether it is dimensionally correct we will first write the dimension of all the physical quantities mentioned in the equation so work done. Let's look at the basics. From the basics, <coughs> how do we get <coughs> the work done? Work done is equals to force you multiply by the displacement. And in this case, let's use the distance. So if work done is equals to force you multiply by the distance, then let's look at the dimension of the force. From the mechanics, we know that force is equals to the mass you multiply by the acceleration. So we can dimension force as M, that is mass, L T raised to power negative two. That is equals to the force. Force, the dimension of force is equals to M L T raised to power negative two. The dimension of displacement, we say it, we replace the, uh, the displacement in distance, and therefore that one becomes L, and therefore, <coughs> when we solve the equation, we're going to get that the work done, the dimension of the work done is equals to m r squared t raised to power negative 2. So we have been able to work out the left hand side of the equation. Let's move on to the right hand side of the equation. 
in the right hand side of the in the, in the right side of the equation, the first the, the first variable is kinetic energy, that is a half mv squared. So, in generally, the dimension of energy, the dimension of energy, is equals to m l squared t raised to the power negative two. The dimension of energy is m l squared t raised to the power negative two. Then the other variable in the equation is the potential energy, that is mgh. We do the same. We look at the dimensions of all the variables, and we start with the mass. The dimension of mass, the dimension of mass is m. The dimension of gravity, a gravitational acceleration, is the acceleration, and the, acceler the, 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 the dimension of the acceleration is l t raised to power negative two. And then the dimension of h, which signifies the height, and in essence, the length, that one is L. So we solve that side, I mean, we solve that portion of the equation, and we will get <coughs> the dimension of the potential energy is equals to m L squared T raised to power negative 2. So we put all the variables now in the equation, and you'll see whatever is on your left hand side of the equation in terms of the unit is the same as in the right hand side of the equation <clears throat> and therefore we conclude that since all the dimensions on the left hand and the right side are equal the equation is dimensionally correct let's look at the second usage of dimension analysis. The second usage of dimension analysis is we can use dimension analysis to derive equations between physical quantities involved in physical phenomena. The method of dimension analysis can also help in finding out the relationship, the relationship between physical quantities. If we know how physical quantities depend on each other, we can find the relation between them easily by equating dimensions on both sides. An example. Suppose a, bob, a pedram bob is hanging from a ceiling and the time period of the, of the oscillations depends on the length L of the thread. It also depends on the mass M of the pedram bob and also the gravity G. In order to find a relation between time and other physical quantities, we proceed as follows. <clears throat> Let time depend on the powers x, y, and, and z of length L, mass M, and gravity G of the bob. Then the equation looks as follows. Or, or the equation is going to become uh, T, that is time, is equals to K, and this K is the constant of proportionality, <coughs> L, which is raised to power x, m raised to power y, and g raised to power z. Let's write the dimension on both sides of the equation. t, t which is time, is going to be given by m. You know, in, in mathematics, if you raise any number by a power of zero, that number becomes one. So, what we're going to do on the left-hand side, we will assign ML and we raise them to the power zero, and then T. So essentially, the equation does not change because M raised to the power zero is one, R raised to the power zero is one. So on the right-hand side of the equation, <coughs> we will have K 
And in this case, K is a dimensionless quantity. And then we will have L. We have L. We will have M raised to power Y. And then we have LT raised to power 2. All of it raised to power Z. So arranging powers accordingly, we will get, we'll get the equation m raised to power 0, l raised to power 0 uh, multiplied by t. That is on the re uh, left-hand side of the equation. On the right side of the equation, we will have m into bracket, m raised to power y into bracket. You add x and z because they have the same powers. And then t raised to power 2, 2z. Equating powers on both sides, we get, we will have formed three equations. Because if we get the powers on both sides, we will have uh, three equations. And the first one, <coughs> uh, we look at the m, with the, all the numbers with base m. Eh? And you find <coughs> on the right hand side of the equation, m is, the power of m is 0. And on the right hand side of the equation, the power of m is y. So technically, we can say y is equals to 0. Then we look at the powers of all the numbers which have the base of L. On the right, left side of the equation, R is raised to power 0. So we can say 0 is equals to, on the right side of the equation, on the right side of the equation, R is raised to the power x plus z. So technically we can say x plus z is equals to zero. That is the second equation. Now the third equation <coughs> we are going to generate it from the numbers. I mean the, 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 the variable t. So t on both sides of the equation, on the left side of the equation, sorry, uh, t is raised to the power one. On the right side of the equation, t is raised to the power negative 2z. So equating the powers then, we will have minus 2z is equals to 1. And therefore, we solve now the linear equations and we will get the values of x. Solving the values of x, the x is going to be equals to a half y is equals to 0, and z is equals to negative a half. Then we substitute these values in the formed equation of t, that is time, and we'll have t is equals to k, r, which was raised to power x, and then m is raised to power 0, and then g is raised to power z, which is negative a half. And the generated equation then is going to be equals to t is equals to k <coughs> t is equals to k square root of l you divide by g. That is the equation that we have been able to generate. The third use of dimension analysis is to change unit from one system to another. We can use dimension analysis, or, or rather we can, dimension analysis is used in obtaining the values of the physical quantity in one system. For example, we want to convert a physical quantity from SI or metric system to CGS system. We can easily do that with the help of dimensional analysis. A physical quantity has two, <coughs> has two parts. One is a numerical or the magnitude part, and the other part is a unit part. Suppose there is a physical quantity X which has a, uni a unit U and the magnitude N. Then we can express such as x is equals to n u. And remember, n, it represents the magnitude, and u, it is a unit. 
To convert a physical quantity from one unit to another, we can use the below relationship. That's N1 U1, it is equals to N2 U2. Whereby, N1 and N2 are the numerical parts and U1 and U2 are dimension or the unit parts of the both quantities. Let's see an example. Convert force of units Newton into dyne. We have a unit, you have a unit of force called dyne. So we will say, let N1 and, N, uh, and U2 <coughs> be the numerical values. And unit of force in SI units, that is in Newton, and N2 and U2 be numerical values of force in CGS system. So we put them now in an equation. N1 into brackets ML T raised to power negative 2 is equals to N2 into bracket ML T raised to power negative 2. N1 is equals to 1. That is mass in grams. Stroke mass in, in kilometers. I mean, sorry, mass in kilograms. You multiply by length in centimeters. You divide by length in meters. You multiply by time in seconds. You divide by time in seconds. <coughs> so when you do that calculation, you will find that one newton is equals to 10 raised to power 5 den. Then we move on now to the the, the next chapter, that is the accuracy, precision of instruments, and errors in measurement. We have seen all the fundamental errors, I mean the fundamental quantities of measurement. Let's see, when you are doing a physical uh, or a physics practicals, eh? <coughs> we, are we are prone to have errors in our measurement. And these errors, we can be able to quantify them. And in this chapter, that is what we are going to do. We are going to see how you can be able to quantify errors in your experiments. Measurement is a basic requirement of almost every science experiment and theory. Be it studying about units and dimension of a body or going through deep theories of electricity and magnetism, we need measurement in everything to understand the basic concept behind it. Every measurement involves some form of uncertainty. For example, suppose you are measuring a building height in order to calculate the velocity of an object when it is thrown vertically upwards at a certain moment. The instrument you are using to measure the building is broken or defective, then your answer will definitely be wrong. The reason behind the wrong measurement is what is referred to as the uncertainty in the measurement. The uncertainties which occur while performing an experiment is called errors. Errors generally occur in the, in the result of our experiment as every measured value has an error in it. It is very important to eradicate errors from our results so that it won't create problems in future. The nature of the error is, bit, is based on two terms, namely accuracy and precision. <clears throat> What is accuracy and what is precision? <clears throat> accuracy is defined <coughs> is defined as the closeness of the measured value to a standard value. Suppose you weigh a box and note and in your notebook where you are writing, instead of noting the correct value of nine, 
you note it as 3.1 kg. It means that the measurement is not accurate. <clears throat> On the other hand, precision is defined as the closeness between two or more measured values to each other. Suppose you weigh the same box five times and get close results like 3.1, 3.2, 3.22, or 3.4. Then you are, you, we can say from what you have recorded that your measurements are precise. But remember, accuracy and precision are two independent terms. You can be very accurate, but non-precise, or vice versa. Measurement of units revolves around accuracy and precision. That is, why we find our experiment readings to be, that is why we record our, <coughs> our experiment readings in decimal form. We have various types of errors in measurement or in experiment, and generally we can define or we can define these types of errors in two broad uh, areas. Uh, the first one, systema systematic errors. And then the second one is random errors. <clears throat> Let's start with systematic errors. The errors which occur only in one dimension the errors which occur only in one dimension are called systematic errors. The direction may be positive or negative, but not, not both at the same time. Systematic errors is also known as repetitive error, as it occurs because of default machines and incorrect experiment apparatus, and incorrect experiment apparatus. <clears throat> These errors take place if the device which is used to take measurement is wrongly calibrated. Some source of systematic errors are as follows. Some source of systematic errors are as follows. One, instrumental errors. <clears throat> these errors, these are errors which occur due to lack of accuracy in an experiment. Instrumental errors occur due to the following reasons. Instrumental errors occur due to the following reasons. One, if the instrument is not properly designed and is not accurate, that is from the design part of the experiment, I mean, of the apparatus, we can attribute some instrumental errors from there. The calibration of the instrument is not correct. The way the instrument has been calibrated, it is faulty. Number three, if the scale is worn off at edges or broken from somewhere, that is the scale of the measuring instrument is not, is worn off. It will again give us the instrumental errors. And then if an instrument is giving the long reading instead of the actual readings, those are the sources of instrumental errors. <clears throat> Examples of an instrumental error. If the marking of a thermometer are improperly calibrated, let's say it is calibrated 108 degrees uh, Celsius instead of 100 degrees Celsius, then the, the person who, who is going to use the instrument, we will, in his reading, he will have the instrumental errors because of the faulty calibration 
of the instrument he was using. Another one is if a meter scale is worn off at the ends, that is the measuring rule, it has, it ha because of the wear and tear, the ends, they are worn off. Number three, if the pressure of atmosphere is one bar and the instrument is showing 1.5 bar, that is now the faulty, the, the, the instrument is faulty. Instead of giving us the atmospheric pressure as one bar, it is showing us 1.5, then it will again give us the instrumental error. <coughs> and again, when you're using a vernier caliper, if the zero of the main scale does not coincide with that of the vernier scale, then we will have instrumental error. And normally that one is referred to as the zero error of the vernier scale. <coughs> We can still have in, um, systematic errors due to imperfect, imperfection in techniques. That is, if the experiment is not performed under proper guidelines, or physical conditions allowed are not constant, then this leads to imperfection in, techniques, in technique errors. These errors occur due to the following reasons. These errors occur due to the following reasons. One, if the instructions are not followed as per the rules of the experiment, if the instructions are not followed as per the rules of the experiment, two, if the instrument is not used properly, if the instrument is not used properly, and then three, if environment is not well suited for external physical conditions, and then five, uh, four, if the technique is not accurate. An example of imperfection as a, as a source of systematic error, if you place a thermometer under the armpit, if you, place, if you want to measure the temperature of the body, but instead of placing uh, the thermometer, on the tongue, you place it under the armpit, the temperature will always come out to be lower than that of the body. Technically, it means that this technique we are using is incorrect. Is incorrect. Another one is from the personal errors, and these errors occur due to improper setting of the apparatus, lack of observation skills in an experiment and are based on the carelessness of the individual only. Personal errors depends on the user or the student performing the experiment and have nothing to do with instrument settings. And I repeat, Personal errors depends on the user or the student performing the experiment and have nothing to do with the instrument setting. Another example, for measuring the height of an object, if the student don't place his hand in a proper way, it may lead to parallax errors and it means that the reading would, uh, won't be correct. Now, having seen the sources of uh, the systematic errors, let's see how you can be able to reduce uh, the systematic errors in experiments. Systematic errors can be downplayed by the following ways. One, improving experimental techniques by performing experiments as per the guidelines and precaution of the experiment. Number two, by using correct, right, right accurate instrument and setting odd worn out instrument for maintainers. 
That is having scheduled maintain maintenance of the instrument. Number three, concentrating more while performing an experiment in order to avoid serial mistakes in taking the readings of the measurements. Concentrating more while performing an experiment in order to avoid serial mistakes in taking the readings. Number four is we can be able to reduce the systematic errors by removing the personal mistakes, and as we have seen, the personal mistakes as far as possible, and keeping the instrument safely after the experiment. So those are the four ways which we can use to reduce the systematic errors in experiments. Now let's go to the second type of errors in experiments. <clears throat> And this one is called the random errors. And random errors are not fixed on general parameters. That is, you cannot be able to attribute random errors on a general uh, parameter or a general source. And they depend on the measurement. They depend on measurement to measurement. So one measurement can give a different value another measurement can give a different value, even if you are conducting your experiment in the same environment. That's why they are named random errors, as they are random in nature. They are, they are, they are not predictive. Random errors are also defined as fluctuations in statistical readings due to limitations of precisions in the instruments. Random errors occurs due to, that is like the sources of uh, random errors, due to one, sudden and unexpected shifts in experimental conditions of the, exp of the environment. Sudden and unexpected shifts in experimental conditions of the experiment. Number two, personal bias errors which even the student is unaware of. And in this case, the experimenter is unaware of. Examples, examples of random errors, or how, where we can be able to see, correct the, 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 the random errors. Example one, a spring balance will give different readings if the temperature of the environment is not constant. You are using the same spring balance, but if the temperature of, of the environment you are in changes, it will give different results. If a person repeats an experiment, he is more likely to get different observation. And this one is mostly exhibited in titration. That is why you do one, two, three. Number three, we can only reduce random errors and we cannot eliminate them completely as they are unpredictable and not fixed in nature as systematic errors are. That is, you cannot be able to, re to redu you can only reduce, but you cannot eliminate random errors in experiments. List count errors, as an example of random errors. All measuring instruments have list count on it. The smallest value that can be measured in an experiment, the smallest value that can be measured in an experiment, the smallest value that can be measured in an experiment is called list count of the instrument. List count defines the main part of the measurement and occurs in both random as well as systematic errors. List count error depend on the resolution of the instrument. The list count error can be calculated if we know the observations and the list count of instruments. The table below 
the table below shows the list count of some instruments. We have, let's say, a Vanya caliper. The list count of a Vanya caliper is 0 0.01. The list count of micrometers crew gauge is 0 0.0001. We use high precision instruments, and remember we had defined the term precision. We use high precision instrument in order to improve experiment techniques, thereby reducing risk count error. To reduce risk count error, we perform the experiment several times and take arithmetic mean of all the observation. This, I mean, the mean value is always almost close to the actual value of the measurement. Absolute error. Absolute error is defined as a difference between, is defined as a difference between exact value and approximate value of the respective readings. It tells us how far a measurement from its true value is. As an example, suppose we perform an experiment in which readings are A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, up to a total number of observation N. Then the value, <coughs> sorry, then the mean value of the measurement can be calculated as follows. The mean is going to be equals to the summation of all the readings you divide by the number of observation. Absolute error is denoted by the notation delta A and errors in individual measurement can be calculated as delta A1, that is errors in individual measurement. Let's look at the error in the reading A1. It is going to be given by the mean you multiply by A1. Errors in the absolute error in reading 2, it is equally going to be given by the mean you minus the reading A2. Absolute error in the reading number three, that is, um, is going to be given by the mean, U minus the reading A3. Remember that for absolute error, it may be positive or negative, but we always focus on the magnitude of it. We always focus on the magnitude of it. Also, the arithmetic mean of all absolute error is the final mean of the absolute error of the experiment. I repeat that. The arithmetic mean of all absolute error is the final mean of absolute error of the experiment. <coughs> that is... It is going to be given by the absolute error in reading 1 plus absolute error in reading 2 up to the absolute error in reading n. You divide by the numbers of the readings. Secondary, note that the values of an ex the, the, note, that, note that values always arise between a mean and the values arise between uh, the values is equals to the summation of absolute errors you divide by the numbers of the reading. Mathematically, the range of the measured value is between a mean minus the absolute error mean. In simple words, in very very simple words, absolute error is equals to actual value you minus approximate value. 
Then let's look at the relative error. Relative error is defined as the ratio of the mean absolute error to the mean value of a quantity measured in an experiment. Instead of absolute error, we use relative error as it becomes easy to calculate errors and make necessary approximation. In simple words, we can say relative error is equals to absolute error you divide by the mean of the reading. An example, if the actual value of a quantity is 50, if the actual value of a quantity is 50, and it is measured value is 49.8, its measured value is 49.8, then calculate the absolute error and the relative error in it. So we will have a mean is equals to 50, and the measured value is equals to 49.8. Straight away, we can be able to, to get the absolute error, because from definition, we have said that absolute error is equals to actual value, you minus the measured value, and therefore it is going to be 50, you minus 49.2 which is equals to 0 0.2. Now, the relative error, we say it, it is going to be given by absolute error, which in this case is 0 0.2, you divide by the mean, and the mean in this case is 50. So absolute, I mean, relative error is equals to 0 0.2, you divide by 50, you multiply by 100, and you will get the relative error in this case is equals to 0 0.4 percent, the percentage error. When we multiply relative error by 100, when we multiply relative error by 100, we get percent, uh, percentage error. Since the value of relative error is very small, it becomes convenient for us to write it in percentage. Mathematically, mathematically, percentage error is equals to relative error you multiply by 100. Relative error you multiply by 100. And therefore, if we write it in its original uh, form, that is the equivalent of relative error, we will have percentage error as the absolute, the, uh, the, 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 the absolute error in an experiment, you divide by the mean. The mean in an experiment, the mean reading in the experiment, you multiply by 100. That gives you the percentage error. We now, we can be able to combine various, uh, various um, uh, errors. So let's look at the combination of errors. When we perform a physics experiment, we have to deal with a number of errors involved. The errors can be in addition or subtraction form or maybe in division or multiplication form. For example, pressure is defined as force per unit area. And then if there, if there are some errors in force and area, there are chances that there will be an error in pressure too. Now, how to calculate, how do we calculate this error? There are two ways to calculate combined errors. There are two ways to calculate combined errors. One of, one of it is error of sum of differences. And then two is error in product or quotient. Errors in case of measured quantity raised to a power. So let's start with the error of the sum of differences. Let's say two physical quantities, A and B, have actual values. Have actual values as A plus minus change in A, and then B plus minus change in B. Then, 
the error in the sum C can, 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 can be calculated as follows. C is equals to A plus B. Then we find the maximum possible error in C. It is going to be given by the error in A plus the error in B. So we'll have delta C is equals to delta A plus delta B. For differences, also follow the same path. Remember that when two quantities are added or subtracted, the absolute error in the final answer will always be the sum. It will always be the sum of individual absolute errors. I repeat again, remember that when two quantities are added or subtracted, the absolute error in the final answer will always be the sum of individual absolute errors. An example, the length of two scales is given as 20 centimeters plus minus 0 0.5 and then then two as 30 centimeters plus minus 0 0.5 centimeters. Then the final length is given by, the final length is going to be given by, we add 20 plus uh, 30, that is 50, and then we add 0 0.5 in L1 plus 0 0.5 in L2. So the absolute error is going to be 50 centimeters plus minus 1 centimeter. Error of a product or a quotient. When two quantities are divided or multiplied, the relative error in the final answer is given as sum of relative error of each quantity. Suppose A and B are two quantities with absolute error A and B. And C is a product of A and B. That is, C is equals to AB. Then, the relative error in this case is going to be given by delta C you divide by C is equals to delta A you divide by A plus delta B you divide by B. An example. Let's have another example. The mass of a substance is 100, gram, 100 plus minus 5 grams. And the volume is 200 plus minus 10 centimeters cubic. Then the relative error in density will be the sum of the percentage error in mass. That is 5 over 100, you multiply by 100, which is equals to 5%. The percentage error in volume is going to be given by 100, you divide by 200, you multiply by 100, is equals to 5% which in total now is going to be 10%. Alas, in case of measured quantities to some power, let's see how you can find the alas in case of measured quantity raised to, power, to some power. Relative error in physical quantity raised to power, some power can be calculated by multiplying S with the relative error of the physical quantity. Suppose there exists a quantity S is equals to A2, where A is any measured quantity, where A is any measured quantity, then relative error S will be given as delta S you divide by, by 2, it is going to be equal to 2 delta A you divide by A. The general formula to find the relative error in such case can be written as S is equals to A raised to the power X, B raised to the power Y, C raised to the power Z. Then the relative error in this case is going to be given by delta S you divide by S is going to be A, delta A you divide by A, Y, which is the power, which is the power of B. So Y delta B you divide by, by B plus Z, where this said Z is the power of C. Z delta C, you divide by C. 
An example, we have an example, um, a relative error, S is equals to A cubed, B raised to the power 4, C raised to the power 2. It can be written as delta S over S is equals to 3 delta A over A plus 4 delta B over B plus 2 delta C over C. Uh, thanks for uh, taking part in my lesson and I thank you. Stay safe. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke. Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then, email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.